Testing, one, two, three. Got it.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our third session of what we call STEM So What Seminar. Uh, let me take a minute to introduce uh, a few individuals. So I'm Dr. Archie Wilmer. I'm a professor of math in the uh, math department. I teach uh, math courses. Uh, we have in our uh, audience uh, some individuals who are part of our planning team and part of our division and departments. Let me start with our planning team. If you are part of the STEM So What planning team, just if you don't want to stand, just raise your hand and uh, I'll just kind of recognize you. Uh, let me definitely start with our divisional dean, who is Dr. Greta Bowling. And uh, yeah, wonderful. We have Jennifer Anderson, also in the math department, Amanda Wisnat in the math department, also part of that planning team. And what we have done over the past year or so is plan and organize these sessions for your benefit. So what I'll talk about in just a second is what, why we're doing this. So first of all, it's titled STEM, so what? It demands an answer. STEM is relevant. STEM is important. And so what we're trying to do is a couple of things. We're trying to inform you, trying to let you know what are the courses, what are the careers, what are the professions, uh, why is STEM relevant, why is it important, how do I get into it. You may be a STEM student uh, taking STEM courses, or you Maybe you're not, but STEM is still relevant to everyone. And so we're trying to answer that question of relevance of STEM. The other thing is trying to inspire you. Each of our sessions have been designed to attempt to inspire you, to let you leave with this feeling of, you know, I never knew about crypto or cryptocurrency or cryptology or information technology, or I never knew about how engineering will keep our soldiers safe, maybe that's something I want to do. Maybe it's not something you want to do, but maybe you have a sibling or a family member or a friend or someone you associate with that would find these sessions inspiring and maybe change your mind or make up your mind about what you would like to do later on in life. This evening, we're going to be featuring horticulture. And so our intent is to answer this question, horticulture, so what? What's the importance of it? What's the relevance of it? I can tell you, you are consuming food, and just because you're consuming food, you are being impacted by horticulture. So whether you're a STEM professional or not, you're or a horticulture professional, horticulture is affecting your life. And so the intent is to inform you and to answer this question, horticulture, so what? And inspire you. Let me take a minute to recognize, do we have any student officer individuals here, that is students who are leaders of a student club on Northwest campus. Stand up if you are a president or a secretary or treasurer of a student club. And while we're doing that, uh, let me come to you and just mention who you are, what your club is, and if there are any important events coming up. And so who you are, what your club is, and any important events. Hello, I am Mitchell Davis. I am the president of the Cyber Defenders Club. We do have a, I'd say every semester we have the National Cyber League. It is a capture flag event with, uh, for Cyber Defenders. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And when is that coming up? When is that happening? Signups are, sign -ups are now. So if anyone is interested in that, see Mitchell uh, Davis about that. And so we have a club member over here. 
Hello, I'm Zane Coons. I'm the vice president of the Horticulture Club. Anything coming up? Uh, no, but if you're interested, come talk to me and I can talk to you about what we have planned. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So the next thing we normally do is try to give out some prizes. We have some giveaways. And so if you haven't obtained a ticket, a raffle, a really it's a drawing ticket, uh, you still have a chance. I'll give you a second to do that. While I'm doing that, there is a sign-in QR code that captures your attendance. Many instructors have offered some points and some extra assignments, uh, grades or things, so make sure you sign in so that we can capture our attendance. So let's give away some things. So the first ticket, so you have your tickets. First ticket, I don't have my glasses on, <laughs> so I can't read that. <laughs> Eight four zero four eight three five. Say it one more time. Eight four zero four eight three five. Okay, come on up. Come on up. What do we have? Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Another drawing. I, I, I don't have my glasses. Okay. <laughs> 8404826. One more time. 8404826. Who has you? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So we'll do, no, we're going to save them for the end. So we'll do some more drawings towards the end, at the end, after our guest speaker finishes the presentation. Let's see. I'm supposed to say something else. Ah, facilities. So if, uh, in, house, in terms of housekeeping, we don't have maid service in here. So please, as you finish things, don't just leave it on the table. Uh, we will have trash places for you to empty those things as you leave. Uh, and we also have uh, some things over here. The facilities, if you need to use the facilities, they are located straight forward past the stairwells, past the stairs, stay on the first floor, up the ramp, to the left and right. So that's where they are. So I'm trying to remember if there's anything else I need to mention. I'm looking for my helpers that are helping to remind me the memory aids. OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Math competition. February 24th. Yes, February 24th is our Jim Bolin math competition. How many of you are coming? Yes, woohoo, see the hands, awesome. It's in the WACB building from 2 to 3 p.m. if you feel like dropping by. Wonderful, any other faculty announcements? Have faculty have anything they want to announce as a, an event that's coming up between now and probably March? So let me, before I introduce our department chair for horticulture, let me mention that next month, month of March, after spring break, on the 23rd of March, we have the featured department is kinesiology. Now, if you don't know what kinesiology is, this is the place to be to find out what it is and why kinesiology is important. So, and for April, we're going to have presented uh, Earth Day, climate change. And so we're still in the planning phase of that. And uh, that's going to be both engaging and informative. 
So without further ado, let me introduce our department chair for horticulture. That is David Cole, and he will take over the rest of things. Thank you. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our horticulture program. Um, I do want to clarify, I am not the department chair of horticulture, but I appreciate that, Archie. Uh, like sometimes there's students that the first day they call, you know, call me or, you know, professor. And so I say, call me David. That's my name. But if you call me professor, I'm going to call you professor too. <laughs> so it goes both ways. Um, I need to put my slides up here probably, shouldn't I? I guess that makes sense. That's my fault, not anybody else's. Oh, that looks familiar. Okay. All right, I'm back. Um, so I just have some pictures, mostly pictures, some slides about our horticulture program, which is here at Northwest Campus. Um, so I've been with the horticulture program and at TCC for close to eight years. Uh, I'm the, f the lab manager for the horticulture program, and I also teach as an adjunct. And uh, I tell everybody, other than the commute, I have no complaints. I love what I do. I feel like this is what I was made for. I love the students. I love learning. I'm, I, you know, I feel like I'm learning as much as anybody. Um, so, and I really love this campus and TCC and, and everyone. So, I'm not going to bore you with that because you can't even read what's on there. But it, we do offer an associate's degree plus some certificates, and they're all stackable um, for uh, anybody interested in pursuing horticulture we do, you know the way our associate's degree is set up it is we do have students that transfer to four-year universities but it's also geared you know it's a technical program uh, a lot more you know kind of vocational training more hands-on so we have a lot of students that uh, the associates is is more of a terminal degree because it's more about the experience the hands-on the the skills the trade of horticulture and whatever you know, part of the industry that could be or in what, whatever way they're using it. So, okay, I did want to, I'm not going to talk about cannabis. Uh, the guy after me will. I'll introduce him here in a few minutes um, when I get kicked off because I'll just keep talking. Um, but I got people in the crowd. They're going to give me the signal. Um, so I did want to show, uh, this is the only thing about cannabis is just the horticulture industry um, has obviously been adapting and in some places where it is, you know, part of the industry in different states across the U.S., and I'm not an expert on that or the production of it by any means, but it is interesting that, you know, shoot, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, in some of the greenhouse suppliers and growing um, equipment suppliers in the catalogs, you start seeing, you know, the page where it shows different types of industry. Cannabis industry is on there, and you click on that, and it's got all this stuff specific to cannabis production. That's about all I know about cannabis right there, no. Um, I don't know much about the production of it, but wanted to show that. So these are just some, most everything else I'm gonna talk about real quick here is gonna be uh, just pictures of our students, of our classes, of our program doing stuff. Uh, we try to make our classes really hands-on. Um, there is some classroom time and, uh, you know, definitely learning the science and more of the technical aspects of horticulture like you would at a you know larger university or for graduate degrees. So still focusing on you know the technical part, at the same time the hands-on experience. And I mean that's why most of us that are in horticulture, that's why we do it. You know? We 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 want to be outside. I know for myself it is, you know, we were talking about the the discipline or the the area of horticulture therapy. So that's actually like you know combining uh, mental, behavioral, physical, all kinds of health therapy type um, programs with horticulture and growing plants. I mean, it's a pretty natural um, fusion of those two things. But, I, you know, I was also thinking about, I get horticulture therapy. I am a user. I am a client. I am a patient of horticulture therapy every day. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, in other words, I love this stuff. Uh, it makes sense to me. I want to feel something. I want to feel the soil and the plants. And I feel like most all of our students, that's the same kind of thing. Um, and so it's really fun to be 
over here at you know Northwest campus and with students and everybody um, we share a lot of those passions so I need to keep moving here uh, this is you know as far as uh, you know, different hands-on things. You know, you might not think I'm going to take a horticulture class and we're going to do electrical wiring, you know, right? Um, but for landscape irrigation, a class I teach typically in the fall, um, underground landscape irrigation does work off low voltage, AC or DC, you know, um, electrical supply. So we do some things not only in the field and buried underground with electrical, but also low voltage stuff, nothing too scary or whatever. Just tickle you a little bit if you get shocked, so... I always tell people that don't be too scared, but uh, you know, but we're doing we're doing some of that stuff in in class in our head house in kind of our lab area where we can spread out and do that. So um, definitely engineering and mechanical aspects involved in in horticulture. There's so many different facets. Native plant propagation. There's some pictures of some stuff that's uh, pretty much all in flower that we are growing here on campus. Uh, pictures of uh, vegetable garden and uh, organic vegetable production class, which now horticulture food crops. I'm currently teaching that this semester and saw a few of you guys that are in the class and horticulture students out there. Um, so this is some pictures from that. You know, uh, I like to call bok choy the gateway green, you know, for people that don't like to eat, you know, like cooked greens like kale and mustard greens and collards. It's like, Hey, bok choy is really easy to grow. You can make stir fry with it, and people try that, you know, and it's the gateway to growing kale, Swiss chard, <laughs> collard greens. You can laugh louder than that if you want. It's okay. You don't have to hold back. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, but we did donate. That, that was from several years ago. We had a nice surplus when we were able to grow all that, and we were able to, to donate that to the uh, Saginaw Food Bank. Okay, this was just a few weeks ago. Greta, am I good? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, oh, hey. This is a class a few weeks ago. We were visiting Opal's Farm, so you can't really see downtown Fort Worth, but we're standing on the opposite side of the Trinity, Li Trinity River on the, the levee, above the levee, um, across from downtown Fort Worth. This is Opal's Farm. It's a nonprofit, and they grow on about, oh, I think it's maybe two to three acres. They have in-ground raised beds. They got a tractor out there. But we are meeting out there for our class for horticulture food crops. And the, one of the, the coolest things about it, it was, it was pretty cold that day. And, man, that cold air just settled in on us as, as we, were, we were out there. And all of us, you know, were trying to hang in. Uh, still very beautiful, beautiful sunset. But Amber, who is a former student, took the food crops class fall 21, and I take zero credit for this, but she was able to connect with um, Opal's Farm and some other local farms, and that was what she wanted to do, and now she's the assistant farm manager and going to be the, the full farm manager within the next year. And she's also a nurse and has four kids and is just an amazing woman, but this is her passion. She's leading us and teaching and telling us about all that. Pollinator garden, this is here on campus. It doesn't look exactly like this right now, right? Looks a little more brown, a little less variety of color, right? Um, but feel free to go out there anytime, but this is more probably a May, June type view of how the, this is something that our horticulture program, we, uh, with, you know, biology, with uh, the classes, with student workers, and a bunch of us just digging and doing the work. It took us about a year, but we built this pollinator garden that's here on Northwest Campus. It was in 2019, from roughly December 2018 till I think we placed the last few, I don't know if I have pictures of the boulders for the seating, placed that the Tuesday or, Tuesday before or Wednesday before Thanksgiving, because I remember that. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, this, some pictures of building it. These are students out there. We had the horticulture club. We had classes. On the right is the shrubs, vines, and ground covers class that was in the summer of 2019. Is that correct? Yes. And we planted, we spent our first week of the summer session, summer one, Monday through Thursday, three and a half hour classes. That's where we had class. And, and we just planted and worked. It was a butt whooping, but it was fun. It was good. And I mean, so everyone had a part in what's, you know, growing, growing now. Um, and so that's really fun. Uh, this is the irrigation class that uh, installing a fully legit underground landscape irrigation system 
at this same pollinator garden. So again, hands-on, that's what this is all about. Uh, this is a picture you see students in our head house at the separate potting benches and they're potting up transplants uh, for our plant sale. The picture, that's an older picture of some of the annual color that we include in our uh, spring plant sale that our department does. It's April 7th this year, which is Good Friday. Um, so it's just one day on campus and we'll be putting flyers up and announcing more of it. So I hope you guys stop by. Um, it funds, well, let me go to the next slide here. So anyway, that's a big deal with our horticulture department and part of our capstone class for our associate's degree. Some pictures of the, let's say, okay. So the money that we generate from our plant sale, we set those funds, those funds aside and we are able to pay for 100% of the cost for students to go on trips across the country to different horticulture related conferences, events, things like that. One of the most exciting ones is the National Collegiate Landscape Competition. And it's every year during spring break, it's hosted by a different university or college campus. And it's anywhere from oh, 600 to 800 college students majoring in horticulture from all different you know, universities, all the big land grant ag schools uh, and community colleges uh, competing in different uh, landscape uh, you know, horticulture industry related events. So it's like, well, what the heck? How do they compete? Well, they have like a truck and trailer. It's two people and you have to drive through an obstacle course and you get scored when you touch a cone or a little tennis ball thing that sticks out. I mean, seriously, I don't know if y'all, any of y'all ever remember the uh, like lumberjack competition stuff that was on, I remember that was like on ESPN when I was growing up. Where did that go? That was awesome. Anyway, this, you know, that's probably the only, you know, that was the only thing I'd seen that was somewhat close to this. And the guys are like, you know, out in the water. What do you call Log rolling? What do you call that? Yeah, you're doing that whole thing. You know, not for this, the, the lumberjack when I was a kid, lumberjack competition. But uh, anyway, this is our students. We went to North Carolina State this last spring break, ir irrigation troubleshooting, hardscape installation. So these are two of our students. They had two hours to complete this. Um, you know, and there was like, I think 20, 25, 30 other teams of two from all different colleges, universities, uh, competing all in the same, you know, they're all, all in this big parking lot at NC State. Um, so I'm about to the last few slides. You can't really see what's on here, but anyway, this is 2020 green industry sales in Texas. And this is the landscape and retail garden centers. Um, is going to be the majority of what's represented here. So there's a lot more horticulture and crop production and, you know, the, the, there's a decent amount that's not captured in here, but this is the industry at large. So Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, particularly the dark green, you know, for retail sales, landscaping sales, grower sales. Okay, this is the last slide. Um, so if you can see, the, the, this is divided up. This is from 2019-2020 data. The total sales for all of Texas for green industry sales, $21.85 billion for Texas. If you look at the different uh, metropolitan areas and which ones had the largest share, there's a percentage at the, the far right. If you consider Dallas and Fort Worth one metroplex, I sure do, you know, uh, you, you are, what, pushing 25%? So a quarter of all the green industry sales in Texas is right here. So, and that's just one part of horticulture. There is a lot of, cause you gotta make money too. You gotta make a living, you know, working outside or doing whatever it is that you love. But there's also a lot of opportunity for starting your own business, for a career. Um, if you have any interest in that and you're, you're not part of our program now or another program, um, you know, we'd love to talk to you or have you consider that, all right? Um, I think that was it. Yeah, okay. Now to the fun part. David, before you finish, let's see if uh, any of the audience members have any questions about what you've given. Any questions? Okay. Uh, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> the Pollen Garden, is it over there on the other side where the WACP is and it's the lake? Yes. Okay. I thought it was on here. Yes. It's... It's free admission and <laughs> open year round for all of you.
We good? Oh. Stephanie Schmitz is giving me a signal. Talk about the walk. So, yeah, no, it's actually very cool. So out there we are trying to create a, I think it's roughly about a third of a mile, Greta, something like that, uh, walking trail that goes through the five-acre nature center, which this pollinator garden we're talking about is a small part of that. It's at the northwest corner of campus, kind of, uh, you know, between the lake and the criminal justice building, um, if you haven't been out there. But that whole area... We're doing a bunch of different stuff, um, but we, uh, yeah, a walking trail that we want for everybody to be able to use. So especially when the wildflowers and stuff start blooming here, come late April, May, June, especially, it should be pretty nice, hopefully. Uh, it's a little different every year, but I know it's gonna be beautiful. I'm gonna be spending a lot of time out there. I know that. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so on to the good stuff. We got that out of the way, all right. so. I'd like to introduce my, my rather new but good friend, uh, Dr. Bradley Bougerdi. All right. He might have written it out and how to pronounce his name, uh, just to let you know. Um, so he is a prof uh, professor of history at the southeast campus of TCC, so kind of, you know, obviously one of our own, TCC. Um, he's been there around 14 years. Um, Obviously teaches lots of different classes, has also written extensively. One of the things that he has written uh, rather extensively about and is still producing, you know, content for and, and uh, among other things is cannabis. Um, and the title of one of those books that is published, and he will tell us way more about it, is Commodifying Cannabis, uh, where we got the title for tonight. So, uh, yeah, Bradley? It's all yours. Okay, got it. Y'all can hear me good? Right on. Um, I just met Greta, so she, she may be too nice to try to like stop me, because I could talk about this stuff all day long. So maybe some folks in the crowd here can set their like alarms <laughs> so that we can have a big beeping go off. I don't know, let's say like what? 7-11 maybe, 7-12 or so. I like to pick weird times, I'm kind of like that because I want to have enough time for you all to be able to ask some questions, which I imagine you will have. So anybody in here want to just kind of get your phone ready or something and we maybe have some beeps or something that you, you guys can stop me around. 7-11, 7-12, who knows, we'll see. Uh, you know, I mean, because I've taught entire courses over a whole semester over cannabis before. I've taught um, an entire couple of weeks over cannabis before in other classes. I can talk about this stuff all day long, right? Um, so let me just begin first off by kind of building a little bit more on what David said. So I would be what you would consider a serious scholar, okay? Uh, by that I mean, you know, if you know anything about academia, the university tends to have people as professors who research a lot and then teach a little bit less. Whereas the community colleges have professors who teach a lot and research less. I happen to be one of these community college professors who researches a lot and teaches a lot. So I'm really busy all the time. Um, I wrote one book on cannabis, I got another one manuscript that's due in August. Uh, I got a couple of chapters out in books. I got articles. I got all kinds of things out there, which I say just to kind of tell you, you know, uh, I, I just look like this, okay? Uh, I, I, I am a pretty good scholar, right? I usually have, I usually have to tell my students that because they look at me and they're like, well, you know, you, you don't look very much like a, uh, a scholar. Um, but there's also another meaning to that today, which I really do just look like this because I got some props on to kind of make a point here. Like I'm wearing this 100% uh, cannabis hoodie. This is a cannabis hoodie, right? It's made out of 100% cannabis. And in fact, my mom made it for me and she had a little bit of cannabis left over uh, that she turned into this little pot thing that's really strong and durable. 
Um, you know, you can pass it around if you want, you know, I'll get it at the end. You can just kind of see what I mean. This is 100% cannabis, okay? Uh, it's not very practical, right? I mean, it's got these huge little <laughs> things. It's way too big. Um, I'm having to wear a shirt underneath this so that this doesn't touch my skin because it's extremely itchy. Um, it's not very warm, like wool is a lot cheaper, a lot better for you in the cold. Um, you can kind of put cotton up together a little bit more as, as, as well. I, I would rather be wearing almost anything right now besides this, to be honest with you. I wouldn't say that if my mom heard me, uh, but she did make me another one that wasn't made out of hemp that I like a lot better. But I'm probably not going to wear this thing. Not only that, but I think there was in the, one of these bathrooms, I went, there was a, a scale. I got on a scale. And I'm about six or seven pounds more because of this, this thing. Literally, I feel like I'm wearing a uh, workout vest. You know how some people do those things where they're kind of heavy? Uh, so I, I got this cannabis sweater on, right? Um, but I also, you know, I got, these, uh, I got these hemp socks on. You see these, these hemp socks? If you, if you ever kind of look at them, uh, you know, they got, a, they got a hemp leaf there. I didn't buy these. Um, I'm not somebody who goes and buys things at stores, really. My, a friend gave me that when I finished my dissertation on, on hemp, and so he, he saw some hemp socks and was, thought it was cool and gave them to me. You know, my mom made the sweater. My wife probably gave me the rest of the stuff. I don't buy things like that. I just kind of wearing them now to show you, uh, to, to make a point that I'm going to get to here in a minute. They are very comfortable, though, uh, these, these socks. I like them now. They feel really good. Uh, they're not made of, of hemp. Um, which may be one of the reasons why uh, it feels a little better. Um, now, if you know anything about this plant, you may be asking yourself, well, why, why did you call this a, a, a cannabis sweater? Like, usually people will say, like, a hemp sweater, right? Uh, if you know anything about the plant, and, you know, you may think, well, okay, that's probably a hemp sweater, um, why do you say cannabis? When I think of cannabis, usually I think of like maybe some sort of medicine some people think of. Um, they certainly tend to think of the fiber more with the term hemp, right? So you may have been like taken aback. Well, why do you call that a cannabis sweater? Usually people say something about hemp. And, and, and kind of same thing with my socks here. Like if, if you know anything about the plant, and, and you saw me walking around with these socks like this, you probably wouldn't think, oh, cool, hemp socks. You probably think, like, marijuana socks <laughs> or cannabis socks. Maybe if you knew something about the plant, um, you'd realize, well, it's not marijuana, actually, because marijuana is uh, specifically a section of the cannabis plant, a female flower that grows on the cannabis plant. So really, what these are, are, are just a cannabis leaf or a hemp leaf. Uh, but you would have probably thought of cannabis or uh, marijuana when you saw somebody with those socks, right? And I think this is important for us to kind of segue into this discussion about this plant, which I think... There's an interesting point in this whole perception that we have of these words. I like to call this cultural botany. Some people call it like ethnobotanists or ethnobotany. I'm a cultural historian. Uh, I like botany. I like horticulture. I like permaculture. I like all of these things. And so cultural botany to me is a way to kind of zero in on the type of work that I do, which I think is a term, cultural botany, that kind of revolves around how humans invest meaning into the things, the plants that they use, right? There's... There's a difference between the objective reality of a plant or the objective reality of a person like me existing, me being here, 
There's a difference between that objective reality and the subjective nature in which we invest those things with meaning. And cultural botany to me is how we invest meaning into the things that we use, right? You have a cannabis plant, which may be an objective thing, but what that means to you is where we get into this era of subjectiveness, if you will, that I'm trying to get at. And this is kind of what I do with my work on cannabis. It's less about cannabis than it is about what cannabis has come to mean to different people. And when you use words like um, cannabis or hemp, they're infused with meaning that send little sub subliminal messages about how we've learned these things. We tend to think of hemp as being kind of practical or, or industrial or something that is good used for industrious purposes. Uh, we tend to think of cannabis as more, if we're supportive of it, medical. If we're condemning of it, uh, sinister. Or maybe if we're nonchalant about it, recreational, which tends to be something that you're using to escape or, or things like this. Something that tends to be the opposite of industrial, practical, productive, European, Protestant work ethic. These are all terms that that kind of go with this idea of hemp as this practical commodity, right? And when you think about these terms, it's important for you to understand that the way we come to understand a commodity or a plant, particularly one like cannabis, which is what Richard Evans Schulte has referred to as this triple purpose plant that, that can be used for all these different purposes. And it grows on more square footage than any other plant in the world that we use for a commodity. So it grows in all these different dimensions, right? Um, and so you, you infuse these plants with different meanings. They're filled with all these different meanings. And I wanna take this time here and the little time that we have together to talk about the nature of the way we have constructed meaning about cannabis based on its manner in which it's used by different people, right? Uh, Sidney Mintz, who wrote a wonderful book about sugar called Sweetness and Power, says, you know, I don't believe that the meaning of a, of a commodity is an inerrant in that commodity. I believe that uh, they mean things to people that society invests them with, with, with meaning, right? Um, and with something like cannabis, I can't stress to you enough about how important this is. Um, for example, we have these two terms that we tend to use specifically with uh, the nomenclature of cannabis, cannabis indica and cannabis sativa. And if you go to one of these dispensaries, They'll have these people who call themselves bud tenders, and they're gonna tell you all these specific nuanced ways in which the certain varieties do certain things and all these other types of stuff, right? But really, when we boil down to what the meaning of these two terms mean, cannabis sativa is a Latin term for cultivated hemp that Carl Linnaeus used in 1752, 1753 to describe the type of cannabis that Europeans used for industrial purposes, to rig ships, to wear clothes. Lower class people would wear clothes like this, obviously, because uh, they're strong, they're durable, they last forever, and uh, they itch, and you know they're different than silk, right? Um, seed, oil, all these other different types of things that are industrially produced. They don't have the capacity to get Europeans high. At least they don't know that it does. They've heard stories about other people being able to use these things prior to 1750 in ways that make them act certain ways, right? But for the most part, there's nobody in Europe really um, using cannabis uh, to alter their state of consciousness. They're using it 
to rig ships that are crossing the Atlantic. A hundred tons of this stuff is, is on each ship that's crossing the Atlantic. They're using it for clothes. They're using it for all these other different things. Everybody's growing a little patch of it uh, in the village in which they live throughout Europe, more so or less in, their, in any given area, but most people know it is that way. Cannabis indica really is just Latin for Indian hemp. Indica has also been defined as orientalis or exotica. These are also terms that uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in 1780s, just a couple of decades after Linnaeus identified the one species, Carl uh, Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, comes up with a second species because Europeans have been going further into Asia and encountering this new substance more between 1750s and 1780s. They start seeing a new different substance and observing Eastern people using it for different purposes. They used it for practical purposes too, but they also used it for medicinal purposes, for recreational purposes and things like this, which led Lamarck to say that there are two species of cannabis. One of them, cannabis sativa, cultivated hemp, the good hemp that productive, important people who are building a capitalist society and the Protestant work ethic and producing and doing all these things uses. And then this strange, sinister one that many Europeans use through the cultural lens that they have about Asia with this term Orientalism, right? They see it as this exotic, strange area where the environment is full of all kinds of lush, strange things that has all this stuff growing everywhere and people are using it for sinister purposes. Now today, um, Carl Hillig, I think his dissertation in 2005 was the best one that really kind of definitively argues that, yeah, there are two entirely different subspecies of, of, of cannabis. Um, one that developed in Asia and eventually moved to Africa. And another one that from Asia, splintered, moved up to Europe and developed more of what we'd like to call today CBD, right? Uh, as opposed to the THC variety. And it wasn't until the Colombian exchange that Europeans began to bring the cultivated hemp with them across the Atlantic and Africans eventually brought the indica varieties with them across the Atlantic. It wasn't until then that you started to see it moving into the so-called new world, which of course wasn't new for the 20 to 70 million people who were living there prior to the Colombian moment and all these other types of things. But nevertheless, it was new for the people who were coming over there, right? There was no cannabis in the so-called new world prior to this exchange of all of these goods. Now, when cultural botany, back to this point, it's, in, it's important for you to understand, I think, that if you want to see how Europeans and later U.S. Americans begin to invest cannabis with different types of meaning, you have to kind of see the way they observe cannabis, the way they come to see this indica variety, which, by the way, there are no uh, reproductive barriers between the two. In fact, there's another one that a Russian botanist in the 1920s and 1930s liked to call cannabis ruderalis, which many would agree that we're, not everybody, but it's starting to become pretty uh, accepted that there may be three species of, of, of cannabis now, right? Um, <clears throat> but what we see here is the fact that there's no reproductive barriers between these different species. There are dioecious plants, which means the males and the females grow on separate plants. You have a male cannabis plant that produces pollen and flowers that pollinate a female cannabis plant that has flowers that are searching for the male pollen. You also have uh, what they would refer to as hermaphrodite plants as well 
that as these different species start interacting with each other more, we start to see expressing themselves even more. But for the most part, cannabis has male plants and has female plants. And very much like <clears throat> when two human beings get together and have children, they may have three or four or five children, and those children are not going to be the same, right? You, I'm sure many of you think of yourself as quite different than your brother or your sister. Uh, uh, you may come from the same genetic source, but your expression of that genetic is much different. Cannabis is the same way. You hear people talking about strands and all these other types of things. Every little seed of cannabis is its own genetic expression based off the combination of its parents. So there are literally infinite number of different strands or flavors or combinations of cannabinoids of which we know of at least 80, only a few of which have been investigated as of lately because of rules and regulations that have prohibited this ex experimenting with the plant for a good while, which if we were going to answer why that's the case, we would need to go back to those perceptions and ways in which people see otherized groups of people using something for different purposes than they're aware of, ultimately leading to things maybe that go beyond the objective reality of a plant, leading to its illegalization. So you got this very diverse plant that can express multiple varieties of its genetic code, multiple combinations of cannabinoids, not just cannabinoids though, terpenes, not just terpenes though, but flavonoids they would refer to them as. There are all these different palettes of cannabinoids that work together to produce the effect that people tend to refer to as a high. But if you do that little QR code thing on there, you get the bibliography that I uh, sent you. There's a book on there by someone by the name of Richard de Grand Prix called The Cult of Pharmacology, where he investigates what a drug is and, and how drugs have an effect on people. We, have, we live in this period of time where we call this the cult of, he calls it the cult of pharmacology, kind of like the cult of personality. You heard of this, right? They, they, you got, Stalin had a cult of personality about him. People listened to him. He had some charisma. He would, he would like manipulate society to believe he was this great person. There was this cult that he developed around him. De Grand Prix likes to use this word cult of pharmacology to describe the manner by which we have come to magically invest meaning into chemistry. Right, here we go with the STEM people. We're going to need some of this stuff here. You know, we have a tendency to think that a drug is going to do something to you when you, you, you put a chemical in your body and it's going to have a natural effect. But, but when, you, when you study things like drugs, actually, th this is just one component of the effect a drug has on you. The chemical that you consume in your body affects you, but that's not the only thing working. It's also your psychological state when you consume something that affects the way you feel when you have it, as well as the culture that you live in that tells you what happens to you when you consume this stuff, substance that works semi as a placebo effect to induce this high. I mean, if you grow up in a society and you think, you know, smoking pot, you're gonna just be hungry all day long and watch you know, to eat potato chips and watch movies all day long, then that's probably what's going to happen when you do it. But if you grow up in a culture that begins to consume cannabis before they go to work, like you see in many areas of Jamaica, to kind of get through the grueling work hours of the day, it may be a much different experience. Or if you grow up in a culture where cannabis is consumed for religious purposes, the meaning of that consumption is going to transform drastically for you. It's the culture, we call that set and setting. The mindset and the culture are both very important for understanding the effect that these drugs have on you. These are important things, I think, that STEM people, people who want to go into the cannabis industry, need to pay attention to. Because 
there is so much stuff going on with this very complex plant that is very much of a problem, starting with naming. I mean, if I'm writing about this in, the, in, in a section of my chapter right now where you can go on to this, what is this website, like Leafly or something like this, and you can like tell them the cannabis strand, and they're going to give you all these different effects. And, and you look at all these names, and, and you look at all these weird names that people have for these cannabis strands, like blue cheese or fruity pebbles and gorilla glue and white rhino, all these these, these strange um, names. And you also hear people say, you know, oh, man, this was the best weed I ever had. I was in this location. It did all these things to me. And, and we all think it's the actual substance when really there's all these other factors going on behind us that are influencing the experience that we have with these plants when we consume them. I think that's something important. If anybody here goes to the cannabis industry, somebody's going to have to figure out some naming branding. That's one of the issues with, 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 with cannabis right now. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's just so willy-nilly out there in the open and they can't get a good hold over the industry. Uh, and they're making it, it's make, which is why it's making it difficult to uh, legitimize it for many people. One of the reasons, I should say, right? There's a lot of other reasons as well, which go back to that subjective nature by which we invest meaning into the things that people use. And cannabis used to be a medicine in the United States of America. When this guy, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who was an Irish doctor working for the British Empire, got a job in India at the Medical College of Calcutta, which was a college designed to teach so-called primitive, inferior, indigenous Indians how to properly use their own medicine, it infused meaning into what he was doing there. There was an imperial power struggle there. You got a guy who's there trying to control with what we call a civilized mission, working on a plant that he sees people who they consider degenerate using. He starts manipulating it and says, well, this is supposed to be for rope and all these other types of things, but let a, let a good Western medicine person come and tinker with it to see if we can make it proper into a tincture that you can consume the proper way. And he does, he creates this thing, and by, by the 1840s, it crosses the Atlantic, it makes its way into the United States, and from the 1840s to 1937, cannabis is a legal, medical, what some people think wonder drug, uh, even though they don't know what cannabinoids are, a lot of times during this time period, so they say a lot of fantastical things about the way, the, way, the way it affects you, but it's a legal drug during this whole time period. How, how does it become illegal with the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act? And then they kind of like change that a little bit by the time World War II comes because the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and cut off the United States' supply to fiber plants in the Philippines that they had been using to replace hemp because it's pretty impractical to try to make into rope and do all these things. It's very difficult to do. The United States always had a problem making cannabis into these productive commodities. So when they got into the Philippines, they start taking the abaca plant, which is a fibrous plant to replace hemp with. But when the, when, when, when the Japanese cut that supply line off, they lose that supply line, so they start doing this hemp for victory campaign. Please, farmers, start growing hemp again because we need rope. And for the 1940s, they started trying to implement it again until 1951 with the Boggs Act, finally made it illegal all across the board, everything. You can't grow it for uh, food, you can't grow it for seed, you can't grow it for rope, you can't grow it for anything. for a number of different reasons that, again, would take hours for me to talk about, but I'm sure I'm getting close to my time period, so I'm going to try to just point out how these confusions around this plant, based off associations with the type of people who use it for different purposes, had a tremendous influence on leading to the con condemnation of the plant. But one thing that we know 
is that when you take away the supply of something that people want to consume, you don't take away the want or drive to consume it. You just create conditions that are riskier to get that consumption. And what we know about risk, <laughs> the higher the risk, the higher the reward, which leads many people to get involved in the industry to supply it in different ways, right? And this started happening in the United States of America in the 1960s and the 1970s, which if you've seen any pictures of cannabis during that time period, it is not very good quality. Certainly wouldn't fit any standards of the modern medical marijuana industry today, which if you hold up a piece of cannabis from there to one from the 1960s and 1970s, it doesn't even look like the same thing. How did that happen? Well, by attacking the plant so much, as I said, you don't eliminate people's desire to consume it. You give them creative new ways to figure out how to consume it. And there was this industry going on called hydroponics that began in the 1930s. That was very expensive. Nobody really liked it. It, it gave the plants this chemical taste. People didn't want to do it, so it kind of went underground for a while until the government started spraying cannabis uh, fields, prohibiting people from importing it, increasing people's arrests and incarcerations of it. People started now going back to, oh, look at these different new techniques of growing plants in water that you can now do in your closet or in your uh, secret space. And what you ended up doing in there is um, ke keeping the conditions very ripe to where you could regulate it more which drastically improved the quality of the plant. So they actually turned it into a legitimate medicine, in a way, by creating this illegal market. But here's the problem. Again, with you STEM and business people should be paying attention to this. While they did this, they laid the foundation, the structure for an industry that is now the most environmentally degradating industry out there because of the amount of electricity that's being used, the amount of chemicals that are being put in to hydroponics. One of the things you got to understand about hydroponics, hydro, water, pond, you're growing plants in water. Water doesn't have nutrients. You have to inject water with nutrients. And these people who created the illegal marijuana industry created these petroleum-based chemicals that are extremely taxing, and you're consuming all these metals that aren't really being tested or anything like this, right? It's an extremely taxing industry. Nick Johnson's wonderful book, Grassroots, about the marijuana industry in Humboldt County in the west of the United States shows this, just how much they're, they're sucking the water out of resource or out of streams uh, and leaving all this waste out there. It's really um, a big problem that could easily be eliminated by um, investing a little bit more in things like aquaponics, which don't use these traditional chemicals, but you create in a very horticultural type of manner these symbiotic ways where you're raising fish and you're pumping fish water into uh, these aquaponics beds and there's all this great kind of like uh, nutrients being created by feeding the fish who release ammonia, uh, which is high in, in nitrites, but then you pump that water into these grow beds that have microorganisms in the grow media that consume that fish waste and turn it into nitrogen. And depending on what you're feeding the fish, potassium and uh, phosphorus, the big three that cannabis very much uses quite a bit of when it is being grown, right? There's all these wonderful different 
ways that we could help alleviate the environmentally taxing aspects of cannabis that a lot of people don't want to hear about. Many, because they started it in the underground business and have invested quite a bit in hydroponics. And so if you read articles until recently, but I've read every High Times Magazine article from 1976 to about 2006, and there's maybe three of them that mention aquaponics, and they say it's just impossible, it's not going to work. You know, a lot of these people are invested in the chemicals that they want people to consume uh, or to, to grow their cannabis, right? Um, not to mention the fact that cannabis is still illegal on the federal level, right? You may be able to do it in Colorado, but at any point in time, the federal government wants to come in uh, and raid, they can. Same thing in Oklahoma. Even now, to, today, just recently, uh, the FDA has decided to put, kind of go back a little bit to kind of put uh, this Delta-8 stuff um, in as a banned substance, which, by the way, I don't think even would exist if people weren't trying to get around laws to produce commodities that people are wanting to consume, right? All of these, I think, are very important points for people in STEM industries who are looking to capitalize in a grow growing, rapidly growing industry that seems, some would say, inevitably on the road towards legalization. However, I would caution you for that um, assessment. Emily Duffin has another really good book, uh, also called Grassroots, where she says that if you do the research in the early 1970s, as well as the early 1990s, it kind of seemed like we were going to head that way as well. But there was a real knee-jerk reaction. When it comes to something like drugs, as Richard de Grand Prix shows us in the cult of pharmacology, anything goes. You can weigh the creation of public problems. Joseph Gusfield's wonderful book about drinking and driving and the creation of public problems focuses on this as well. Uh, you can highlight something, and when you think something's on the road, one little thing can occur and cause a, a, a drastic shift in the direction of where people are going in terms of the way they see a substance and its legalization or criminality, right? Um, it's interesting that we, we think this way about drugs. Um, I think it's important to know that the subtitle of Richard de Grand Prix's book of the cult of pharmacology uh, is about, it says, you know, how the United States became the world's most problematic drug culture. And if you pay attention to what he's saying in this book, he makes this very important case that brings me back to the points that I was mentioning at the beginning. A lot more goes in to the, legal, the illegalization and criminalization of a substance than the actual effects of the substance itself. In effect, there really is no such thing as a good or bad drug. There's only good or bad relationships with drugs. For as bad as you think something like heroin is, if you're mauled by a bear and your leg's falling off and you got to walk a few miles to survive, it, it, it may be something that I'd want. <laughs> but if I'm 12 years old, my father just committed suicide. I've been abused. I've left and felt a life of pain. And somebody gives me this drug that makes me feel so good for a little bit of time. Well, that may end up being a situation where it's not going to be in your favor, right? But one of my friends and uh, another great scholar, neuropsychopharmacologist at Columbia University, Carl Hart, often says, you know, if you have a 12-year-old kid who's on heroin, I promise you that child has a lot more problems besides the heroin that need to be addressed. 
that we don't really like to talk about. We just like to arrest the people, get it over with, and pat ourselves on the back and take pictures of all the stuff that we've confiscated and then move on. But we're not getting at the source of the problem. Now, I just skipped to something that, you know, heroin, which is far more um, dependent forming uh, than cannabis. Both are, though, if you're a cannabis user and you think it's not addictive. I mean, about 9% of everyone who ever consumes cannabis develops a problematic relationship where they can't stop if they don't if they want to. With heroin, it's about 37, 38 percent at most. Some even say more like 26, 27 percent. Yeah, I mean that sounds pretty strange to you, right? Out of, out of all the people who could you know consume heroin in their life, about 26 to 37 percent of them develop a problem. But what this tells us is that it's not just about the drug but about the reasons behind the drug use, the meanings behind it, how we talk to people who become dependent on substances, which is different from addiction, right? Addiction is defined as the compulsive consumption of a substance despite negative consequences in your life. You can't stop. You know it's, 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 it's causing you harm and it's not working. Which, by the way, prison is a negative consequence, okay? Uh, so if you put somebody in prison for consuming a drug, you're actually feeding towards the addiction because the addiction is defined as the psychological attachment of a drug that you can't use. Dependence is different than addiction, right? Dependence means you've developed some sort of tolerance which tends to protect you from overdose. You develop some, there could be a lot of people who are dependent on opium because they've been in the hospital for six or seven weeks and then they get out and they got this huge headache and they don't know why they're uh, feeling bad, but they don't realize they're going through opium withdrawal. Or they feel like they got the flu, which is kind of what most neuropsychopharmacologists would argue is what heroin withdrawal is. But if you're going through heroin withdrawal because you're psychologically attached to the drug, it's overwhelmingly more painful. These are nuanced conversations that we need to be having with each other. These are nuanced conversations that people going into these very big, highly lucrative businesses that'll make a lot more money than we will ever teaching about this stuff need to be paying attention to. Look at that. <laughs> Only one of you followed the code? Dang, oh, well, it, it, it woke me up. That's very good. Perfect time to end, I guess, and open it up for questions. Because like I said, I could talk forever on this. So now that we got a little bit of time, let's see what uh, people have to say. Anyone have any questions? Wait for the mic, hold up your hand. If it waits on the mic, okay, I'll see your hand first. So what are we going to do about, what do we think about marijuana? What, uh, should it be legal? Should it be illegal? Um, is generally the question I think that we're getting at here. You know, um, as someone who's studied drug policy and 
the ways in which societies construct meaning about the substances that they use. I guess people are on different time scales here. Wow, right on. You know, um, one thing that I have found in my research is that the criminalization of any substance does more harm than good. We didn't have any criminalization laws in this country about any substances until the 1914 Harrison Act, which cre was created and predicated on the fear of newly freed African Americans consuming cocaine and Chinese immigrants who brought smokable opium with them to the country. Prior to that, the average middle-class woman in the United States of America would consume about 100 drops of laudanum every day just to get by. Nobody called her a dope fiend or a drug addict or anything like this. But when the Chinese bring their smokable opium, which pharmacologically does about the same thing, it infuses the substance with more fear and causes more reactions. So what I would say, the best thing to do is to be aware of something that I like to call a cultural lens. You wear a cultural lens. The way you see the world is influenced by the lived experiences that you've accumulated over the course of your lives and your life. And if you grew up hearing all kinds of bad things about a substance, you're going to have probably an adverse relationship with that substance. You're going to, it's going to inform your perceptions and understandings of that substance. But if we can be aware that we have these cultural lenses, that everybody comes to these substances for different reasons, and those who develop a problematic relationship with them, if we invest more time into caring and learning and listening instead of incarcerating and criminalizing, then I think we will do a better job healing people who are struggling with substance use disorder. Maybe that's I would say it. Good question. It sounds like to me we need to understand more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Truth. Absolutely. Okay. Someone else had a question. Would you say the uh, drugs like marijuana or uh, cannabis would be under, uh, would need a reform like how the 18th Amendment had with the prohibition? Yeah, we, we repealed the Volstead Act that caused the creation of organized crime in this country, one could argue, right? We would, nobody would know who Al Capone is if it wasn't for the Volstead Act, right? Uh, so when we repealed the Volstead Act, what ended up happening is that there were a lot of people with jobs that were designed to go attack people who are consuming alcohol. And instead of getting rid of those jobs, we created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and had Harry Anslinger take that job. And then we start now attacking things like cannabis, right? And so what happens is we're, we're focused on the job security and there's, there's an interest in our society to keep that prohibitionary status alive because there's money to be made on incarcerating people. I mean, it used to cost the federal government 50, 45 to $65,000 a year to keep somebody in prison. And now we have these um, for-profit prisons that are coming and contracting it out cheaper. I can do it for $35,000. And so the government will contract it out to them and, of course, you know, cut the AC off, you do all these other types of things, creating more negative repercussions that feed more into addictions that don't help alleviate the problem. Addiction is something that really needs to be entirely revamped. I'm telling you, there are so many people in charge of addiction specialists that know nothing about what they're talking about. When I was doing my dissertation, I, I, I infiltrated some of these um, uh, 
meetings where people would have to go to when you get arrested for something and then you have to get this certificate to pass and then they'll help you be back into society. And this guy teaching the class was tell, telling people that the Aztecs were, smoke, were, 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 or were, were sacrificing people because they were smoking marijuana. And when I tried to raise my hand and say, sir, there, were, there was no marijuana in the Americas when the Aztecs were an empire. The <laughs> Europeans brought that over. And you know, he said, I don't know about that conspiracy stuff or whatever you're talking about is, is what he said. And I, I just wanted to be like, hey man, I, I study this stuff for a living, but I, didn't, you know, I couldn't do that. So I just be, was quiet and continued to listen and wrote voluminously in my journal about all the different erroneous things that he was saying right there. This is, this, uh, uh, I, I, get back to your point, is that it's a whole structural issue. It's not just one or two different little things that we need to, to focus. We need to really invest in understanding. Uh, and, and, and first off, teaching people that you wear a cultural lens in the first place. Many people don't even realize that you see the world through these lenses that are much different than everybody else sees. If we can recognize that and see it in the first place, then maybe we can start changing some of these very deep-seated cultural problems that we have. Yes. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Sorry. It may be, it is kind of legal. The teacup program does have a medical marijuana program. It's just, it's so uh, weak in potency that nobody's going to want to uh, sign up and spend all the money to get something that, like that. Hemp is legal. I, research purposes, I went and got uh, and planted 50 plants at my, at my parents' house, and it was a disaster. They, they all got root rot and died on me, uh, but it was a good experience. So it, it, it is there. That was CBD hemp, which is, is, is legal to grow. It, it could be. Who knows what, what the future holds? I'm a historian who looks in the, the future. I don't know. Is it addictive? Sex is addictive. Uh, video games are addictive. South Korea has 400 rehab facilities that houses kids who go for video game addiction. There's a great book called Glow, maybe it's not too great, the guy's a little uh, hyperbole. I mean, there's some of the stuff he kind of like makes you think oh, the apocalypse is coming because kids are playing video games. Uh, and so he, he kind of exaggerates a little bit, um, but it's worth reading Glow Kids to show you that addiction is less about the substance than it is about the psychology and the culture that people grow up in. Now, there are some chemicals that increase dependency more, like opium can make you more dependent than cannabis can. Like I said, about 9% of people who ever consume cannabis will develop a problem that they feel like is causing them harm and they can't finish it, they can't quit because they've developed a psychological attachment to the substance. We all do this. The way you are introduced to a drug is going to have a tremendous influence on the relationship you develop with that drug over the course of your life. If this is, you see this in Native American communities with alcohol, right? People tend to think that Native Americans have a genetic predisposition to be alcoholics. There's no research ever to show such a thing. But so many Native Americans develop so many negative relationships with alcohol because historically it's been a source of problems. Puritans used to come and get Indians drunk till they passed out and steal all their stuff. They, 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 they did all these horrible things and every time these Native Americans were associating themselves with alcohol, it ended up bad. And what we know is that your cultural lens can influence these things. There are people I mean, if you look at the, the humoral theory of medicine, you know, when you stab yourself in the arm and blood starts squirting out, you're not healing yourself. But so many people in medieval Europe got better after going through bloodletting because they really thought that they were doing something that made them work. That's why bloodletting survived for so long. It didn't work for George Washington. He died of bloodletting, actually. Um, but if you, your mindset 
is tremendously influential when it comes to addiction. We don't pay enough attention to that. We like the cult of pharmacology. We like to blame it on the drug so that we can spend all the money attacking the drug and create this massive business that goes with the criminalization process that emerged in the late 19th century, early 20th century with the rise of this social reform era, social reform movement that people felt righteous about taking these sinister substances that were coming from Orientals, Asiatics, Africans, who were all considered inferior in the minds of these people who are working with these westernized medicines, right? And so you can't separate this entire history. It's kind of like you know, you hear people say, is it nature or nurture that makes you who you are? E either or. This is a false dichotomy. It's not an either or question. It's this deep, significant, symbiotic relationship that begins the day you're born and the way you respond to your environment, all the things that happen to you, building your identity over the course of it. You can't just separate somebody from all that history and say, this is the reason you're, you're, you're that way. We do that with drugs. We, we, we think, because they're easy scapegoats. We can, we, can, we can say, this is the problem. It's the drug that's causing everybody all the problems. Right? You, you see these video commercials about meth mouth. Like, oh, if you smoke meth all night, your teeth are going to fall out. That's not true. If you're smoking meth all night and you're not brushing your teeth and you're eating potato chips all day, yeah, there's probably a pretty good chance that your teeth are going to fall out over time. But Ritalin is the same pharmacological substance as methamphetamine, the difference is the route of administration. When you smoke something, it gets to you much quicker compared to oral consumption. And you don't see kids, millions of kids on Ritalin having their teeth fall out because they're consuming the same pharmacological substance, right? You know, crack and cocaine are the same pharmacologically. You add something so that one can be smoked and the other can be orally administrated. The route of administration is key in understanding the effect that a drug is going to have on you. If you're inject injecting something in your veins, it's going to have a much different effect on you than if you're smoking it or versus orally consuming it, right? These are all the questions that we got to be thinking about instead of the very just broad, is this addictive? It's not that simple, unfortunately. And with history, I try to tell this to my students every day, every time I teach a class, Keep it complicated. I know that all you want is the grade and get the check box so that you can go off and be a nurse or be whatever, but unfortunately, you lose quite a bit when you try to reduce something that's highly complex. And so you got to keep it complicated. If you live by that code, you'd be better off. Keep it complicated. If somebody gives you a simple explanation, chances are you know, they're missing something, uh, particularly when it comes to history, particularly when it comes to you know, psychopharmacology. The Let's person. put a period right there. Let's give Dr. Berger a Thank you very much.